like to first start uh, by thanking Leslie and the entire PAM team, Chris McCarthy, who's sitting in the back. Um, the enthusiasm that uh, we've been met with both um, prior to bringing the show here and installi installing the whole show in just a week has been phenomenal, so thank you. Um, there's a clear connection between Provincetown and the Grosses, and I hope to illuminate that a little bit with you this morning. Um, I'd also like to thank my staff and board of the foundation. So I'm joined here today by Brittany Cassandra, who's our collections and programs manager. Um, my colleague Joyce Green could not be here today, but I would like to thank her as well. Um, and our incredible board, who, which is led by Mimi Gross, who's the daughter of Rini and Hyam. She could not be here. She's receiving an award this weekend um, at another museum. Uh, but she really has the vision um, that has really propelled this foundation forward um, after the passing of both of her parents. Um, this lecture uh, this morning is really kind of working with this exhibition, but through the lens of Chaim Gross's biography. So I'm going to be talking about his life trajectory and the way that artists sort of interacted with him, came into his life, impacted his work, impacted his social circle, um, and changed the collection. Uh, because we have an immense collection in New York um, at 526 LaGuardia Place, we have over 12,000 objects. Uh, and that's works by Heim Gross and works by other artists. Uh, so this show that you're seeing today is just a segment of what we have to offer. So I do recommend that if you're in New York, please visit us. Um, I have pamphlets, I have cards, I will be happy to welcome you. And it'll help make the context of this show so much richer to see it um, the way they had it when they lived there. So there's a lot of dialogues going on in the exhibition. There's the dialogues between artists, both in an aesthetic, intellectual, and social way. There's also the conversation between different locations. So there's a conversation between New York and Provincetown, and also a conversation with artists who are working in Europe and coming to the United States um, in the mid-century, really as a result of displacement um, during World War II. Uh, we also see a number of different styles. Um, for example, this conversation between representation and abstraction. Um, we also see a lot of different sources so uh, specifically non-Western, uh, and what I mean by that is uh, not sort of Euro in the European traditional model. So you see the influence of African art, oceanic art, and native art as well um, from North America. So I wanna show uh, first Haim and Rini Gross. Uh, this was shot in their home in Provincetown, um, and it really still looks the way it did as when they lived there. Uh, they were very smart in that when they were both still living, they had this idea of maintaining their home and collection together. So they established the foundation originally in 1974 and then formally incorporated in 1989. Um, and when they formally incorporated it in 1989 as a not-for-profit, they were thinking about uh, keeping everything intact um, sort of as a time capsule. So when you visit us, you'll see that everything's installed the way they had it. Uh, and they were thinking philanthropically. Um, Hayam throughout his life was always purchasing the work of other artists um, and basically uh, working with other artists to not only advance his own career through exchanges but also theirs as well. And he was purchasing works. Uh, the exhibition um, circa 1945 is over 40 works um, that's enti entirely drawn from the collection. Um, and though we call it circa 1945, we do have a little bit of wiggle room there. So we're starting with uh, around 1930 and ending around 1960. And there's a lot of works in this collection that are given a circa date uh, because we don't know exactly when they were made. Uh, we're trying to underscore the fact that even though Gross was a figurative artist, he was looking at abstract art, absorbing it, and learning from it, um, in addition to working sometimes very abstractly himself. So here we have a wonderful photo uh, from 1932, and this is Gross posed with one of the objects in the show, the Lindbergh family, which was carved in 1932 in Golden Street, Eaplewood. Uh, so at this point in 1932, Gross had just had his first solo show, uh, and he was born in 1902 um, in Europe and had immigrated as a teenager to the United States. 
Uh, he did not study sculpture in Europe. That was something uniquely he learned in New York. Um, so between 1921 and 32, which is a relatively short span of time, he went from a student first learning how to be an artist um, to having his first solo show. Uh, he also married Rini in 32, which I think is a wonderful sort of quick turnaround um, into thinking about you know, how quickly his trajectory was um, in his life. So here's the sculpture um, seen with its pair. Uh, so the Lindbergh family, which is the piece on the left, uh, was done in response to the kidnapping of the aviator Charles Lindbergh's baby. Uh, so if many of you know the history, this was this incredibly uh, important uh, social event, political event. Everyone was discussing it in 1932. And You'll notice that Gross is using a lot of motifs borrowed from African art. Um, at this point, he would have been looking at African art and he would have started to collect his first pieces. Uh, so on the left, I'm actually gonna go back so you might be able to see it a little bit better in this image. Uh, there's kind of a little bit of a baby form, crawling form on the top part of that sculpture. So that references Charles Lindbergh Jr., the baby that was kidnapped. And then about a third of the way down on that column, you'll see two orb-like forms uh, that reflect uh, the parents, uh, Charles Lindbergh and his wife. And then on the right, uh, sort of the evolution of this political event um, is the Hauptmann trial. Uh, so Richard Bruno Hauptmann was uh, tried, convicted, and then executed uh, for the crime of the kidnapping and uh, murder of uh, Charles Lindbergh Jr. So about, I would say, a sixth of the way down, you'll see an oval shape, sort of a tipped back head in profile, and that's depicting Hauptmann. Um, and then at the top, you see three sort of lobed shapes, and those are actually, if you turn the sculpture, or if you were to go into the gallery and look at it, you'd see that it's basically a head holding its hands and crying. Uh, so we see a little bit of uh, what Gross was thinking. Maybe he wasn't sure if perhaps Hauptmann was innocent. Um, and a little bit of the social commentary, which is really uh, rich um, in his early work. Uh, and another thing to note about this is that Gross was working um, with materials that hadn't traditionally been used uh, for fine art sculpture. Uh, I mentioned that this is Golden Street Eeple Wood, which is a tropical hardwood usually used for industrial um, materials um, a lot of times is used for making furniture um, and there was just one of the many woods that he was pulling from these lumber yards and working in a new way and he never painted his works or added um, sort of any extra patina other than wax to the surface he believed that the natural material material should come through so another really key piece that we have in this exhibition from Gross's early work is Roosevelt and Hoover in a fist fight, <laughs> which is wonderfully playful, um, but very different stylistically than his other work. Um, it's flat, which was a technique he often used. He often used boards, um, but it's very stylized. I think he was looking at a lot of Picasso when he did this. Um, and there's a lot of incised lines, which he didn't often include in his works. He usually has more volumetric forms. Um, so if you can look closely, you'll see that there's two figures. The one on the right that's a little bit higher, um, a little bit more in the foreground, that's Roosevelt. And then on the left, you see Hoover kind of in shadow, which to me tells you what he was thinking and who he wanted to win the 1932 election. Um, and this is mahogany, so once again, this tropical hardwood, not traditionally used uh, for making sculpture. Uh, but Chaim was uh, very innovative in this regard. Gross's way of working uh, was not only uh, interesting for scholars and critics who were looking at the work, uh, but also to other artists. He was depicted by many artists um, in paintings and in photographs, looking at the way he worked because the way he worked was very physical. It was uh, very close to the object. Uh, we have a film on our website called Tree Trunk to Head, where you can watch him working. This was a film done in 1938. And you see him lifting and hefting this log, and you realize how physical this kind of work is. Uh, so this portrait here, another piece from our show, um, is by Milton Avery and was painted in 1944. 
uh, shows uh, Gross kind of in a sort of a mid-stage of working on a sculpture. Uh, he has a rasp in his hand and he's smoothing the edges. So he's already sort of worked out the general forms by chiseling. Um, and even though this is representative, it's figurative, um, the forms are very flattened, uh, the outlines are strong, and the colors are intense and vibrant. Uh, especially the, the green of the shadow along his neck and the bright uh, sort of orangey pink of his ear. It's not necessarily what you would see when you're looking at someone, but um, it's wonderfully expressionistic. Uh, and as I mentioned before, photographers also loved capturing him working. Uh, this is a photo by Elliot Ellisofen, shot in 1938, showing Gross um, with a chisel in one hand um, and a mallet in the other, and he's working on a 1938 sculpture called Acrobats Balancing. And this was carved in lignum vitae, so another uh, very hard wood, and it's in our foundation's collection. You can come visit it in New York. And this image was used along with a group of photos uh, for his book, The Technique of Wood Sculpture. Uh, Gross published it in 1957. Um, I actually spoke uh, to someone who I believe is in our audience uh, who was saying that the book meant a lot to him, <laughs> which was wonderful to hear. Uh, it's mostly focused on methods and materials as opposed to um, sort of theories about uh, style, um, but I, it's really a very important book and um, he goes into a great deal about the different kinds of woods that you can use um, and unfortunately a lot of those woods are not available today. They've been heavily overforested. Uh, this, I should also mention that this also was shot in his East 9th Street studio, um, which was in Greenwich Village and was surrounded by other artist studios, um, many of whom um, are featured in this exhibition. So I mentioned the artist connection because I want to mention Gross's first friends when he was in New York, uh, which were Moses and Raphael Sawyer. Here you see Moses, Sawyer, and Gross posed for a photo in 1922. And they actually met in 1921. Uh, Gross started taking classes at the Education Alliance Art School, which was also a Jewish settlement house in the Lower East Side. And when he met Moses Sawyer, it was immediate connection. They were close friends from that very day, and he also went home with the Sawyers um, and had dinner with them that night. He didn't have plans for if he was even going to eat dinner, uh, so that was really um, special to him, and he remained friends with them for the rest of his life, and we have a lot of both the Sawyers' work in our collection. So they had this brilliant idea in 1924 that they were going to hitchhike up along Cape Cod to Provincetown, which they did, um, and they ended up in Provincetown. So this is a watercolor. It didn't fit into the realm of our show, um, but this was painted in 1924. So Gross hadn't even become a sculptor at that point. He was still really thinking of himself as a painter, um, but you'll see the, the docks, and then at the back you'll see the Pilgrim Monument. And it's much more realistic than a lot of his later work. Um, and the funny sort of story about them on this journey was that they got stuck in Provincetown had spent all of their money um, and then Moses had to basically wire his dad and say can you send us ten dollars so we can get home. Uh, so eventually they got back um, and Provincetown and Cape Cod stuck in, in Gross's mind from then on. Uh, so we see here uh, drawing and doing watercolors continued to be important for him. Uh, this is a watercolor in the show from 1950 called Fishermen with Fishing Nets. And he frequently worked with 2D uh, materials in Provincetown, did some sculpture, but it was not the same kind of work that he was doing in New York. Uh, what attracted me to this particular uh, watercolor is the fact that you have this all over pattern, uh, sort of fractal fractal, um, sort of crystalline looking. Uh, you see the connection with a lot of these other artists, what they were doing in the 40s, um, and much different than the really realistic landscape that I just showed you from 24. 
Um, and also in 1950 was the same year that the Grosses purchased their home in Provincetown, uh, which was once the studio of George Elmer Brown. Uh, so the story is that Rini was picking berries um, in the hills and she saw this building that was just surrounded by trees. Um, she walked to the window and could see that there was art supplies, paints, and finished paintings inside there and was immediately sort of intrigued. Um, so they ended up making that their home and continued to summer in Provincetown, um, you know, until their deaths. Um, and then a little bit later, um, in 1962, uh, the Grosses moved from their 105th Street home down to LaGuardia Place, where the foundation now is. Uh, the furniture, which you see in this photo, is very Victorian. It would have looked a little bit more at home um, in their 105th Street home. Uh, but when they bought the building that the foundation is now in, they had this opportunity to take an industrial building and make it what they wanted. Uh, so at the top, you'll see there's the coved molding, the drop ceiling. That was Haim's design. Um, they bought the building in 62, they moved in in 63. And all these little details um, were really chosen by the Grosses, um, along with two architects named Arthur Malson and Don Ryman. They also had the art installed salon style, so everything is stacked. And you'll see that Gross's way of installing art is very lyrical. Um, there's a lot of movement to it. He did this both in, his paint, in the way he installed paintings, but also in the way he installed the sculptures down on the first floor in his studio. Um, everything has a movement. There's movement forward, back, and top, bottom. Um, there's also African art. Um, installed um, sort of throughout the European and American paintings. Um, and there are, in this photo, quite a few pieces that haven't moved um, since they were first installed. Um, and on the far right, there's uh, the painting Rest Period by Marston Hartley, which is uh, featured um, in this exhibition. And if you were to turn around and look at the other side of the living room, so this is the third floor of the building, um, you'll see another shot uh, showing works by uh, Roberto Mata, the entitled work that's in this show. Uh, below that, the portrait of Gross Working by Avery. There's also a still life by Hartley, a small Joseph Stella, works by Moses Sawyer, uh, uh, Edward Giobi, uh, another Avery. And you can see that there's a lot of connections with the artists done along the wall. Um, and when Haim and Rini walked through the space, they would have been able to tell you stories about each work, and they would have seen sort of a visual uh, grouping of, of their friendships, basically the networks displayed on the walls. And it really looks the same. So this is a photo taken just last August, and um, that's yet another wall in a living room. That's the west wall, and you can see that they have uh, Beautiful paintings, two by Raphael Sawyer, one by um, Hartley again, Theodora Stamos, um, and then in the top left hand corner, a uh, piece by John D. Graham. Unfortunately, this work was not uh, in fit condition to uh, send here, which is, makes me very sad, but this is a very important piece in our collection. Uh, John D. Graham is a lot of times not known for his paintings, but more for the effect that he had on other artists in the mid-century. He was a very much a larger-than-life character. He had really incredible ideas about what art should be. And Gross was one of his many sort of friends and followers. Uh, they united not only over ideas, but also this passion for collecting African art. And Graham not only collected and dealt in African art, but also helped others collect African art. He helped to build the Frank Crowninshield collection, which uh, Frank Crowninshield was a Vanity Fair editor. And then Gross later in the 40s purchased some really important pieces from the Crowninshield collection when it was sold at Sotheby's. So these personal connections ones are helping to build the collection and also what you see in the exhibition. So the Grosses had a lot of parties. Um, this photo was shown, is showing um, Federico Castellan, a uh, Spanish-American surrealist on the left. 
Gross looking at the camera. Uh, the woman is Sylvia Carew, uh, whose painting Provincetown is in the exhibition. And then on the far right, uh, holding the drink, that's Hudson D. Walker, who is a very important collector of uh, American art. And that was 105th Street apartment. Uh, and, but they continued to have parties um, even after they moved. They were always thinking about entertaining and having really rich sort of salons and conversations about art. Once again, you'll see the African artists surrounding them. I want to highlight the painting by Sylvia Crewe, not only because it depicts Provincetown, uh, so it's returning to its birthplace, um, but also just to talk about her as an artist. Uh, she was very active both in Provincetown and New York, um, and she did a lot of tapestries in addition to paintings. Uh, so I think when you look at this, uh, tapestry is done, you have to think very two-dimensionally when you do it, um, which I think you can see reflected in this painting. Um, we also had this conserved um, with a grant funded uh, through the Greater Hudson Heritage Network, and the vibrancy of the colors is so much more apparent now. Um, we didn't even realize quite how much it had sort of gotten darker over the years, um, a little bit dirty, um, but it looks incredible now and it really brings out uh, her color sense um, as well as her sort of flattening of the forms. Um, but Gross had a lot of connections with Provincetown and a lot of the artists within Provincetown. Uh, so here uh, Gross is modeling a very realistic portrait of the artist Carl Knaths, uh, who you have seated on the right. And this was done in Provincetown in uh, 1965. Um, and this photo is by Bernard Gottfried, who is a very important photographer of that period of time as well. We have a whole series of photos of Gross working on this piece in our archives. And we do have a copy of the bust um, in the Foundation's collection. Um, and here's the Knaths painting we have uh, featured in the exhibition uh, called House Plants from 1953. Uh, Knaths was known not only for his uh, brilliant sort of colorations, um, but also the theories behind his work, um, a lot of which related to musical structure, uh, which you also see in um, some of the Leger works as well from the show. Um, another important uh, friend and neighbor in Provincetown was the artist Byron Brown. So we have two works uh, by him in the show, uh, one of which is seen here. This is called Head of a Woman, uh, done in 1938. Uh, it's very classicizing and uh, sort of evoking Picasso from the teens. Uh, everything that we have by Brown um, in the Foundation's collection is a little bit different in style, I would say, but this one is uh, particularly uh, relevant uh, to the works in the show. Once again, you see the flattening of forms, these beautiful colors, um, and there's also the incising of the hair. And maybe you might be able to see that better on the actual work, but he scratched um, into the paint. And that's something that you see a lot in Milton Avery's work as well. And one of the stars of our show is the Peter Busa Provincetown, um, which is around, from around 1948. Um, and we, once again, recently had this conserved and it looks phenomenal. Uh, Chaim Gross had always seen this painting as a horizontal painting, which was a little bit confusing for us. So he had it installed in his home, tipped uh, counterclockwise 90 degrees. Um, and when you look at it that way, it does look like a landscape of Provincetown. Um, the little sort of red A-frame there becoming um, a lifeguard tower. Um, however, when you flip it as it's signed uh, vertically, you can see somewhat of a figure and maybe that red A-frame becomes a hand. Um, but generally, uh, it's fairly abstract. Uh, Busso was very um, interesting in that he was part of the Indian Space Painters Group. Uh, so they were looking at uh, Northwest Coast Native American arts and also oceanic arts um, for inspiration, trying to come up with a very uh, American version of abstraction that sort of continued the work of the Europeans or of Cubas. Um, and what's notable about it is there's no figure or background. Everything's on the same plane um, and sort of intermingling like that. 
Um, and then we have two smaller little boosas um, in the show, shown uh, near Provincetown. Uh, one which is similar in style on the left, and then the one on the right, which is a little bit different. This is from 43, so a little bit earlier, um, showing his more continuous line drawings that he was doing um, under the influence of uh, surrealists. Uh, so I mentioned that Gross uh, was purchasing from artists directly, but he was also purchasing works by other artists um, through, the, through his friends. Um, so for example here, um, the I. Rice Pereira uh, mixed media piece, uh, which was purchased from Busa along with a group of other paintings. Uh, so you can see a little bit of the influence um, of Bauhaus here. Um, during the WPA, or Works Progress Administration, um, Pereira found the Design Laboratory, which was a school for industrial design in New York, um, where she was also a teacher. Uh, and she was very influential, and unfortunately this is the only piece we have by her in the collection, but I think it's really quite special. Um, also, um, in our section where we're looking at the figure and sort of the front part of the exhibition, we have this uh, oil painting by Henry Botkin, uh, uh, which is called Ceremonial Figure from 1951. And I mentioned that Gross was shopping a lot. He was buying from his friends and contemporaries and also making wonderfully helpful lists. Um, that have now assisted us. So we call these our inventory notebooks. And he would make lists of everything he made. Those were in separate books. And then these were the ones where he would write information about his collection. So he included the date of the work, uh, the last name, the artist. Um, and then you'll see on that line, I've marked it. I might be able to here. It says PR for present. So it was a gift from Botkin uh, to Gross. Um, and then this last column here where it says 100, that's what he thinks that it was worth when he made this list. Um, and he was constantly editing it. And you'll also notice there's other names, um, for example, um, like Joseph Stella, Horace Pippin, uh, Castellan, Max Weber, a lot, a lot of people that you might um, have seen in other exhibitions. And I mentioned before the Ninth Street Studio and how it was such a hotbed of activity. All these other artists were coming through. Um, and one of Gross's near neighbors was Willem de Kooning. Uh, so another really important piece uh, from the show that we're very happy to have here at PAM um, is an ink on paper drawing by de Kooning that was done in 59, which is signed very prominently uh, to Dear Chaim. Uh, although the two had known each other since the 30s uh, and were friends at that time, they sort of reconnected again in the 50s uh, when they were both working in Rome. Um, another sort of European transplant uh, during the 40s uh, was Fernand Leger. Uh, so had to leave Europe during, due to the Nazis um, and ended up in New York uh, where he formed a friendship with Gross. Uh, so these are two works that are gouache on paper. Uh, the one on the left is music, and the one on the right is the still life from 1942. Um, and once again, you'll see that it's inscribed to Haim, Aheim Gross, FL 42. And this is very uh, common in our collection. A lot of times, things are signed directly to Gross. Um, so you'll see here. Once again, the inventory notebooks I, with a little red arrow, I've marked Fernand Leger, still life, EX, which was his markings for exchange. So presumably he gave uh, Leger something in return for the gouache on paper. And then his estimate of the current value um, in 1958. Um, so these are once again all in our archives. Uh, there's a lot of other well-known artists here, Philip Evergood, Joseph Stella, Ashul Gorky, uh, Gwathmi, uh, Ben Zion, By Byron Brown. Actually, the head of a woman is here as well. Let me see if I can, oop, sorry. Um, see Byron Brown here, head of a woman, EX exchange, and then he thinks it's worth about $25 um, in 1958. <laughs> 
These numbers are quite funny because nothing has retained the value or what they would expect. Um, it's quite funny. So Gross was uh, photographed in 1944 by the social documentarian Marion Palfi, who is very much understudied, and I would love for someone to write a whole dissertation on her because she's fascinating. Um, this is for a project where she was looking um, at uh, people of color, um, Jewish artists, uh, women artists, uh, people who uh, were not sort of typically um, acknowledged at that period of time. Um, and she photographed Gross um, at work, teaching, and also at home. Uh, so this photograph shows Rini Gross brushing Mimi Gross's hair. Um, and then Yudi, the son, is standing behind Haim and sort of fixing something on his lapel. Um, and then in the back, you'll see a little sculpture here by André Masson, which is also in our exhibition. So Gross was photographed at his home in New York and then also um, in Provincetown. Uh, so here, a uh, photo of him in his Provincetown home uh, with the sort of omnipresence of the African art in, in all of the places where he lived. He always loved to be surrounded by uh, his collection. Uh, you see the forms in his sculpture, as I mentioned, the Lindbergh family, uh, the, the totemic stacking, um, the use of the figure and the use of wood, uh, but also you see the translation of these sorts of uh, works into his drawings, um, and specifically his fantasy drawings done um, during World War II and afterwards. Uh, the fantasy drawings were a unique development um, within Gross's uh, whole oeuvre. Um, he started making them as stream of consciousness sort of exercises after dinner in the evenings, sometimes listening to music, sometimes sitting in silence. And they can be incredibly disturbing. They can be very erotic. Uh, they're incredibly complex, detailed pieces, once again, have been um, sort of understudied. Uh, and a lot of times, they pull out memories that he had from what he saw during World War I. Um, and the destruction of the place where he lived and uh, sort of that kind of carnage coming through again as he heard about what was happening in Europe during World War II. Uh, you also see these images of works that he collected filtering through. So for example, on the left, you see an oceanic mask. In the middle, a Dan mask from Cote d'Ivoire. And then on the right here, this figure, um, which is, you can see as a base, so it's supposed to be a sculpture um, that's then pierced with nails, um, which is something that you see in a lot of uh, power figures from the Congo. Uh, so he's directly referencing his collection, and he's sort of working out um, the deeper meanings of these pieces. Um, and later, he continued using the kind of forms that he developed in his fantasy drawings um, in a project he did for illustrating the Book of Isaiah. So this was a little bit later in 1972, um, but I did think it was important to include it um, in sort of in talking about this idea because he continued uh, to work in the style. Um, and once again, you see that all over patterning that a lot of artists are using in the mid-century. Uh, his other innovations of that period of time, sort of post-World War II and into the 1950s, uh, were sort of directly influenced by his time in Provincetown and also subsequently um, returning to Europe for travel. Uh, he worked in Rome in 1957, 1959, and 1961. Um, which was very much life-changing. Uh, he started working in bronze, which he really hadn't before. And his technique of working in bronze is very different than a lot of artists. Um, so for example, he would start with um, armature, which you see on the left, this uh, wire structure that he would then build up with plaster. Um, and then on the right, you'd see the development of the forms that he would then have it cast in bronze. Um, he also traveled extensively uh, in Israel and in a lot of other countries in Europe. And the flattened forms and the sort of 
interest in drawing that you see um, in a lot of his drawings in Provincetown translate to his sculptures um, in a way that we don't see in his wood sculpture. Uh, so this is Gross uh, in front of the LaGuardia Place building, so in front of where the foundation is today, uh, posed uh, with Birds of Peace from 1965, and this was shot by, an, by a photographer named Marvin Balotsky. Um, so you can see that these forms are uh, sort of these circular forms then have the beard, birds um, piercing sort of through them, flying through, um, which is once again that patterning that you see coming up in his drawings, but made three-dimensional. And a fantastic photo uh, by Rudy Burkhart of a similar sculpture, this is Seven Mystic Birds, um, that was installed um, in the Grosses Provincetown yard. Um, and just showing you know, how beautiful this landscape really is. So <laughs> I wanted to sort of end on um, this note, which is talking a little bit about uh, the Gross's legacy and also their legacy with Provincetown. I do not think that, that Gross would have been the artist that he was and became uh, without this link. Uh, to Provincetown, to the amazing network of artists who are living and working here. So many of you walked down Commercial Street and I hope you've taken a similar photo <laughs> with uh, the tourists, um, which has stood in that spot for a very long time. Um, and actually has become a little bit of an icon of Provincetown. I, I, in the archives, we found this New York Times article from 1983 um, showing uh, the tourists. It's just, you know, sort of general coverage of Provincetown, but once again, uh, sort of this enduring legacy um, beyond what circa 1945 really shows, um, but decades worth of uh, connection. Uh, circa 1945 in, you know, is looking at a lot of different artists' work, a lot of different uh, styles of abstraction, uh, but I hope that you're, you're give, given a chance to look at it a little bit deep, more deeply today, um, and I'll also open it up for questions, because I'm very interested to hear Questions and also anecdotes. Um, I've heard a few last night during the openings. I heard some wonderful stories about uh, what Haim and Rini were like, but I would love to hear um, a little bit more. Yes? Sasha, I have a question. Yeah. Um, I didn't see Fritz Boltman appear in any of the images or anything, and I was surprised. Were they friends and did they share works? Because Boltman I... also made sculpture in bronze. I don't have evidence that they uh, exchange works. There's nothing in our current collection by Boltman, um, but I'm happy to look and see if I can find anything. That would be very interesting. Yeah, it's curious. What, what I find interesting about the collection is sometimes um, there's artists that you, you're like, oh, of course they knew one another, and it makes a lot of sense. But every once in a while, you do come across an artist you think belongs in the collection, and for some reason isn't. And it doesn't always mean that they didn't know one another. Um, sometimes he just collected more from certain people, um, and, I, and we don't really know why. That's a good question, though. Anyone else? Yes. Did he do any traveling in Africa? He did. He did, but he only uh, traveled there in the 1960s. He had one very, very long trip there. Uh, so his perspective uh, while he was there was that the culture was incredibly rich. He filled up numerous notebooks full of beautiful drawings. Um, however, he didn't really purchase any art when he was there. Uh, the kind of work that he was used to seeing in New York and then also in Europe as well um, was what we call historic. Uh, so meaning that it was usually from the uh, 19th century or even the early 20th century. It was made for use um, and was not made for the tourist market. Um, and really had been extracted from Africa due to colonialism. So that really was what he was used to seeing. Um, so what he saw when he was there was really made for tourists. Um, so even though he enjoyed it very much and it really added to his experience and understanding of the work, um, he didn't really purchase anything there. Sasha. Yes, Mary. I, I, have, I, I have two questions. Mm -hmm. um, one is general, one specific. The, the, the general one is, I'm very curious if there's a history of when uh, I started to purchase, like what was the first thing, mm -hmm. making the decision to purchase other artists' work when you are a poor immigrant is an interesting thing. And 
which leads to also like how did they finance what may it, 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 it looks quaint now if you think oh they paid two hundred dollars but that was actually a lot of money mm -hmm. if, if you think you're an artist so that's my first question and added to that is I was particularly intrigued by the two Gorkies because the Gorkies are very early I would be interested to know whether they were purchased at the time roughly that they mm -hmm. were made or whether the purchases or exchanges were done. Both brilliant questions. Um, so the the first question, um, most of the earliest pieces that uh, Gross was acquiring was was through exchange. So he didn't have the kind of money to buy things, but when you're producing a lot of work, it's very easy to exchange. Um, and then sort of sort of secondary part of that is that Gross was incredibly lucky. He actually had success during his lifetime and also fairly early on um, in his career. Uh, probably not, I was, was he sort of making money from art until I would say the late 30s, sort of the WPA essentially was allowing him to survive. Um, and then in the 40s, he had a lot of uh, sort of commercial success. Uh, but he was, I think, very deliberate in the fact that he purchased other artists' work. Um, he considered that um, as part of his, I wouldn't say duty, because that, that has a, sort of a negative connotation, but um, it wasn't just about loving the work, but I think he also had a little bit of that philanthropic ideal early on um, to support others. Uh, if Mimi Gross was here, she might not agree with me and say it was all about the art and that's what he was passionate about, um, but I, I do think that might have been subconscious, um, that sort of interest. Uh, he also diversified the way he was funding things in that he taught his entire career. That was essential, um, not only to his sort of survival and livelihood, um, but also his important connection with his students. Um, that uh, helped give him new ideas, kept him sort of young and, and fresh, and it was really important to him to share his knowledge, and that's the reason why he wrote multiple books about his techniques. <laughs> Um, in terms of the Gorkies, great question. Um, I believe they were both purchases. Brittany maybe can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but one of them, the more realistic uh, still life, was purchased very early. Um, the more abstractive one, I believe, was a little bit later. Um, if you want dates, I'm sure that we can pull something up from our archives, but I don't know off the top of my head. <laughs> Oh, um, what galleries in both New York and Providence kind of show? Ooh, good question. Uh, so in New York, uh, I, I know I don't know too much about where he's been in Palm Town. I mean, obviously, Pam <laughs> was one place, um, but other gal commercial galleries as well. Uh, in New York, uh, his first solo show was at Gallery 144, which had a very short life, um, but was very important in showing these very new young artists. Uh, he, for the longest time, had a relationship with Bella Fischko at Forum Gallery, and the foundation maintains a relationship with Forum Gallery, um, but that wasn't until 61. So there was a few decades there prior to that where he did not have a single gallerist representing him. Uh, so it was up to Chaim and Rini to essentially market his work and sell his work. Uh, he was featured in not only solo shows, um, but also a lot of group shows as well. Uh, you know, throughout that whole period of time, he was showing everywhere. And uh, I think that's a little bit uncommon. Most, most artists who are successful early on usually have one champion, um, but this wasn't the case for, for Chaim. Yes, Patty. Yeah. Um, can you talk a little bit about the Taurus? Um, I assume it was a commission. Uh, I see through his work an element of whimsy, but this is especially humorous. And is this like a one-off, or is it? It does it fit into this? It definitely fits in, um, but it is funny because sometimes when people see this for the first time and they're used to his more traditional wood sculptures, they look a little bit puzzled. So I, I understand that. <laughs> Absolutely a sense of whimsy. Uh, the tourist was done uh, sort of mid-career for Hyam, but it actually extends back to a wood sculpture he did originally in 29. 
So very early on in his career, he did a pairing of sort of a short squat man and then sort of a busty, slightly taller woman. It's a little bit less exaggerated in the wood version just because of the material. Uh, but this is the same time period that he was doing uh, East Side Girl, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Arts collection in New York. Um, there was another piece called West Side Girl, and he was doing these kind of, I would say, tropes, uh, where he was sort of finding like a, a kind of person and then depicting them. Uh, so he frequently returned to the same ideas later on in his career, and I think the Taurus is a wonderful example of returning to the same idea but in a different material. It was so interesting to see the slide of his wood sculpture with the, you know, the chip, and then mm -hmm. he showed the watercolor that, that he had done earlier than that with all of those marks, you know, the, the uh, background, as you talked about, the fractal and, and all the facets. It seemed, it seemed to, to predict that he would find sculpture you know, quite natural, and even though in the painting it's it's additive and the sculpture is subtractive. It's the same kind of feel for texture. That's a brilliant point, and I've actually never thought about that before. Very interesting. Uh, Gross, even in a lot of his finished works, left those surface textures. Um, sometimes to delineate like hair from the rest of the body, but also a lot of times just overall. Uh, so there's a really important early sculpture uh, that the foundation owns called Happy Mother, which is sort of this uh, horizontally oriented woman with a sort of child kind of creeping around on her side. Um, and the whole body of the work has that ch chisel mark texture over it. He deliberately left that. Um, and it, yeah, it totally changes the piece um, not to have it completely smoothed down. Very interesting. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. What's the relationship between Gross and Motherwell? That's a good question. I know that they knew one another. Yeah, they were, yes, they were. They overlapped in many, many years. Um, but I, it's weird. We don't have any works by Motherwell in the collection. Uh, we do in our library that was amassed by Heinrich. Have a book or two on Motherwell, but I don't think. Uh, that Gross was very close with a lot of the Apex painters, or the ones that he was close with, it's because he was close with them very early on, sort of before Hoffman had this huge influence and before you have all these Apex artists sort of appearing in the 40s. Um, it might be interesting to explore that a little bit more, um, but I, I don't have a really clear answer other than I know they knew one another, but it wasn't a close relationship. Well, I know, I know Bolton was here too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But he spent a lot of time in Europe. Mm -hmm. and a lot of his work was cast in Europe. He was there. So I don't know how long he was here and there. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. You did get a question a few minutes ago about, uh, about both showing in Promise Town. Uh -huh. And I didn't really hear the answer. Did he ever show in Promise Town? He did. He did. I, I unfortunately, I don't know off the top of my head um, exactly where he was showing in Provincetown, but I, I know um, we have a lot of records of him showing, especially in group shows. A lot of group shows. I think the first Pam group show was in the 40s, I want to say. So he was, he was definitely showing here and, and often. Um, he, you know, he and Rini spent usually four months here every single year. Um, so it, it was very integral for him to continue his work here, um, even if the work was sort of different in, in style and sensibility. But my sense of it is, while they were very social mm -hmm. and high bodies did work in Bob's town, he was not really part of the art gallery scene. The Kutz Gallery was very famous at the time, and he really let the Hoffman people mm -hmm. uh, was by that point, he was showing in the Sunday alley. Mm -hmm. But the dad did really not, as I understand it and remember it, having lived through part of it, mm -hmm. the part of it, I don't, I don't really think of him now. Yeah. You mentioned it as part of the very buzzy, busy artist group trying to, mm -hmm. to socialize by uh, 
exhibiting more appropriate. I, I think you have a point. I think you absolutely have a point that he, he was committed to his own style. Um, and he interacted a lot with a lot of people socially, but um, he wasn't an abex artist. Um, so there was a huge group of people who he could you know, be friends, friendly with and social with, but they weren't going to have the same kind of connection because they weren't doing the same kind of work. And you're, you're absolutely right about that. Mm -hmm. Another question. There was a photograph of four people on the far right who identified that Paul Mann and Hudson W. Walker. Yes. Not Hudson D. Walker. Hudson D. Walker, yes. Oh. I might have misspoke, I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So now, Hudson Walker <laughs> had a gallery in New York for a period where he showed half the followers and people like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's, these connections that Susan brought up about the, you know, who was hanging out with who, when, and where, mm -hmm. you know, it's strange that. Hind, and so he was so respected by a lot of the FX guys, kind of kept to a different circle. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. It is interesting. Yeah. But Carl Van was a good friend. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a very good friend. Um, yeah, Gro Gross did have certain friends who were a little bit sort of younger artists, um, but it, it would say it wasn't the same kind of relationship that he had with, with the, the older crowd. Any other questions? Um, yes. I was thinking, you mentioned before that he wasn't represented in New York for many years by a gallery, mm -hmm. a specific gallery, that he and his wife were marketing his own work. And but perhaps that was true while he was in Provincetown also, where mm -hmm. maybe he didn't trust dealers or galleries, some artists don't. Um, and therefore, while he knew people socially, mm -hmm. he didn't know the gallery scene or didn't participate in the gallery scene uh, consciously. Mm -hmm. It was a choice he perhaps may think that's a possible between New York Absolutely. and, and, and Provincetown. That's quite possible. Um, I think there, there's definitely some, some great high probability of that being the case. Absolutely. Um, well, if there's anyone who else who would like to talk to me or to my colleague Brittany, um, you're welcome to uh, talk to us after. We will also be in the show, so if you want to talk about any of the works that are on view, um, we'd be happy to do that. And thank you so much for joining me this morning, and stay cool.